The requirements of the empire include huge amounts of minerals and metals. The army demands thousands of tons of iron, lead and other metals for the manufacture of weapons and military machinery. Large quantities of stone, lead, marble, cinnabar and precious stones are needed both for the comfort of many Roman citizens as well as for public works. The state uses silver, tin, copper and gold to mint coinage. To meet the huge demand, Roman engineering power is applied to the exploitation of mineral resources. We know very little of ancient mining practice in general and of Roman techniques in particular. Until quite recently, serious and careful studies of known archaeological sites had not begun. But fortunately, in recent years, some scholars and specialists have made exceptional and important advances. Despite the many uncertainties that still remain, the knowledge that has been acquired up to this moment offer us an insight into Roman mining that we had never imagined. To learn about the effort and extraordinary mining engineering that Rome deployed, we will begin an exciting journey to some of the most spectacular Roman mining sites. All of them located in the Iberian Peninsula, probably the richest mining territory in the empire. We will start with the Roman gold mine of Filiel in the small municipality of Lucillo in the province of Leon in northern Spain. This is the Duerna River, a modest river only 54 kilometers long. In this river, the Romans found appreciable concentrations of gold. Gold is found in river sediment in the form of tiny particles barely visible to the naked eye. Separating it from the rest of the materials is a challenge, but taking advantage of the high density and heavy weight of gold, the Romans devised an ingenious process to extract it. And they did it in a way that could be easily scalable, industrializing the process to handle many tons of material. The enormous proportions of these mining operations have left significant traces. Studying these traces reveals clearly how the mining was carried out. These were the great heaps of river sediment from which gold was extracted. Originally, they were much larger. Numerous channels were cut to bring large amounts of water to a chosen location. We can follow the course of the gullies dug by the water. Water, along with the sediments dragged along by the flow, was directed to these gullies. Washing channels were cut into the gullies. At the point of origin of these washing channels, large rocks were removed by hand and placed to one side, forming large mounds. These mounds still in place today are called morias, and are one of the most characteristic remains of Roman mining sites of this type. With the large stones removed, the water flowed along the washing channel where twisted branches and other obstacles trapped the larger gold particles. 
animal skins would retain the finer gold particles. Water together with the waste material was directed down the valley towards the river. The accumulation of waste material at the end of the washing channels is another of the very characteristic traces seen with these types of mining operations. This was a continuous and highly effective process. As the large sediment deposits dissolved, the washing channels were enlarged or rerouted. Large accumulations of stones, the murias, grew up along them as the accumulation of waste on the banks and at the terminus of the channel. How this process worked and evolved is revealed by the overall view given by this example, which runs for more than 20 kilometers. Gold occurs in seams of quartz found in slate and quartzite when they were created by complex geological phenomena. Some rivers acquired gold that they swept up and carried away in the process of erosion of the land through which they flowed. It is logical to assume that the river waters erode only part of the vein through which they flowed, and therefore more gold will remain in the part that remained to be eroded. The smart thing to do, therefore, would be to locate and exploit these seams. We will now go to the Portuguese city of Valongo, very close to the great city of Oporto. We are in the Sierra de Pias, southeast of the city of Valongo. The Ferreira River runs through this gorge. Here the Romans carried out a careful survey and found further down a concentration of gold-bearing sediments. It was a sediment deposit about 300 meters long by about 100 meters. Some 450,000 tons of gold-bearing land. In order to move the sediments and wash them, Roman engineers decided to collect water from the river itself. To do this, they calculated the elevation of the washing site at which they needed to receive water and from there plotted a course for a canal that went several kilometers upstream. Much of the canal remains are preserved and can perfectly be seen from here. We are walking along part of the canal route, presently in very poor condition. During its construction, Roman workers crossed several court seams with a high gold content. Originally, before the river created the gorge, the seams were continuous. The river divided them as it carved out its path. Therefore, the seams continue on the other margin, which was also exploited. But the seams must have been so rich and of such a size that at some point open cast mining began. Huge quantities of material were removed in this way. The magnitude of the operation can be gauged by the enormous holes in the mountain. Trails and paths run through a multitude of excavations and mine shafts of Roman origin that walkers observe with interest, even if they do not understand very well how they originated. There is a very important and well-known rule for hikers in this area. It is strongly recommended not to leave the marked trails at any time. The 
The reason is because hidden among the vegetation are hundreds of dangerous mine shafts, some like this one, are 80 meters deep. Some of the shafts are covered with slabs or are marked, but most of them are uncovered and represent great peril for those who walk outside these marked routes. As well as the hundreds of mine shafts, there is a multitude of galleries. Many of these galleries, some of them hundreds of meters in length, led to large cavities where mining took place. Here you can still see chiseled out of the stone the supporting sockets that once housed the scaffolding and wooden structures that were needed in order to remove material from inside the mountains. Mine shafts and galleries linked together in what seems to be a perfectly organized labyrinthine pattern. An immense network of many kilometers the actual extent of which we still do not know is today being investigated, since most of the mine shafts and galleries are yet to be explored. This investigation is an exciting adventure that has already begun, and we cannot know when it will end. Over time, many of the drainage galleries have been blocked, and beyond a certain depth, they have stopped working so that the mine shafts and galleries are flooded, preventing us from knowing how deep they go and how far they extend. To explore these shafts and galleries, we will one day have to drain the waters, as the Roman technicians did almost 2,000 years ago when they built them. The colossal mining complex of Valongo is made up of hundreds of mine shafts, with kilometer after kilometer of galleries that extend over an area of about 50 million square meters, the equivalent of about 5,000 football fields. It is staggering to think of the human labor that had to be invested in drilling innumerable shafts and galleries by hand and to excavate and move the millions of tons of material. But this material extracted from the ground could not be treated in the same way as river sediments, as it required considerable additional effort and several additional processes before it could be washed. To find out about this additional effort, we will travel about a hundred kilometers northeast of Valongo to the small parish of Tres Minas in the municipality of Villa Poca da Aguiar. Tres Minas is one of those places far from everywhere and suffers from the general phenomenon of rural depopulation. Its population density does not exceed 10 inhabitants per square kilometer. However, Tres Minas is one of the most important ancient mining sites and it is beginning to attract a large number of visitors. The visit to the Tres Minas mining complex begins at this observation point. From here we can see the Corta da Ribadeña. In mining, a corta, literally a cut, is a quarry a hollow created where material is removed and it is therefore an indication of where further mining operations for mineral exploitation have occurred. There are three quarries in the Tres Minas mining complex. One of modest dimensions is the Lagoinas quarry. The other two are much larger. The Covas quarry and the Ribeirinha quarry. From inside the Ribeirinha quarry, we get a good idea of the amount of material that was removed from it. 
The study of the remains of water channels that run to the lip of this quarry tell us that large amounts of water were used for washing and processing the materials in the initial stages of exploitation. Some scholars point out that perhaps the water could also have been used to help advance the quarry workfront, and they offer some theories about this. One of them proposes that wooden wedges would be driven into carefully chosen natural fissures. These would be drenched in water, so that when the wood wedges swelled, they would increase their volume and so break the rock. Another suggestion is that large fires would be built at the base of the quarry front in order to heat up the rocks, after which dropping large amounts of water on them would cause a thermal shock that would break the rock and thus facilitate its removal and processing. There are other engineers and scholars who do not agree with these theories and believe that water was used only to wash the materials, leaving the advance of the quarry front to manual excavation techniques. Further investigation is still ongoing. In any case, what is certain is that large quantities of water were delivered to these quarries by means of well-planned and constructed pipelines. In the same way, we know that significant amounts of water had to be removed. This is shown by several galleries like this one, whose obvious purpose was to drain water out of the quarry and direct it down into the valley. The curious shape of this gallery corresponds to the advance of the work front. As the work progressed in depth, a gallery was drilled at a suitable level to drain the water. When the depth of the dig increased, it became necessary to adapt the gallery or even make a new one. Ultimately, this resulted in the curious appearance of this gallery. Here in the Kovas quarry, a good number of galleries have been preserved, and by studying them, we discover how the mining work was carried out. In the early stages of excavation, material had to be removed from the quarry for processing. As the quarry floor increased in depth, however, vertical removal became increasingly difficult so galleries were open to enable the material to be removed horizontally. But when the quarry became even deeper, it was necessary to build a large extraction gallery that would allow the material to be transported to the valley. That was the most suitable place to build the large facilities needed to process the material. This is the gallery that was built to remove the extracted material from the Kovas quarry to the valley below. And just as with the Ribeirinha quarry, in the Kovas quarry, also it was necessary to drain the water down into the valley. Therefore, it seems that the smart thing to do was the use of this gallery, intended for the removal of quarried material, to allow also for the drainage of water. And so it was done. The gallery was designed and constructed with both uses in mind. On the left side ran the drainage water. On the right side traveled carts loaded with quarried material. The tracks of the carts are clearly marked on the ground. At this point in the gallery, probably to reinforce it, this pillar was built. This pillar is made of large granite blocks. Let us look at them carefully. They all have distinctive hollows evenly covering all their surfaces. Why? This is the material that was being cleared from the quarry, quartz rocks and shale. 
Small particles of gold, practically invisible, are hidden in them. In order to extract the gold, it is necessary to convert these rocks into sand, in order to then be able to wash the sand and let the gold settle out, just as was done with the river sediment. To crush these rocks, Roman engineers devised ingenious and powerful milling systems, most likely powered hydraulically. The working part of these systems were these hard granite rocks, which despite their hardness were heavily worn by the repeated blows and the extreme hardness of the rocks being crushed. When the wear on one surface became too much, the stones were turned over to use one of the other sides. In this way, the millstones now discarded, due to the wear of all their surfaces, were used to build this pillar. Many such stone blocks have been used by locals as construction material through the centuries, and we can see them today in the nearby towns, in numerous houses, monuments and churches. The enormous quantities of material extracted in Tres Minas necessitated the construction of powerful milling facilities, most likely driven by the force of water, and large washing facilities were also needed. The largest of these were in the lower part of the valley. Consequently, the demand for water in Tres Minas was huge. To guarantee its supply, it was necessary to capture water from different rivers and springs and to build a complex network of channels several kilometers or miles long to transport it to the places needed by the quarries. But not only was it important for the water to reach the precise place where it was to be used, but also to regulate its flow and its pressure upon arrival in each site. Roman engineers incorporated dams and water reservoirs in order to regulate flows and hydraulic power. As we have seen, the effort to obtain large amounts of water for the mines was considerable, but the work of extracting the water from them was also very great. At a certain depth, workmen often ran into underground water either from surface drainage or by arriving at the water table. This water made work difficult and prevented progress. Under these circumstances, water had to be drained to the outside. This presented a new challenge. Let's travel to the modern city of Irún, in the province of Guipúzcoa, in northern Spain. Irún is the largest town on the Bay of Chingudi, the name by which the locals call the beautiful estuary of the Bidasoa River. Irún has a privileged location that has throughout the centuries kept it as a very important commercial and logistical hub. In 1969, important Roman archaeological remains were discovered here in Irún. In 1992, the remains of the Roman port came to light. Successive studies suggested that all these remains belonged to the ancient city of Oyaso. All this led in 2006 to the opening of this magnificent museum, the Roman Museum of Oyaso. Until very recently, the territory of Guipúzcoa, the province in which Irún is located, has had intense mining activity. We know that such was the case in Roman times also. It is thought that the important port facilities of Oyaso, and the fact that it is one of the destinations of the Roman road that came from Taraco, 
were a reaction to the importance of this mining activity. One of the mining operations around Oyaso is that of the so-called Arditori mines. It is thought that exploitation of this mining complex began even before the Roman times and continued to be exploited later, even in contemporary times, since the operations ended only in 1984. Silver, lead, iron, zinc and fluoride have been extracted from Arditori. In one of the access portals to the Ayako Aria Nature Park is where we find a really impressive presentation of the Arditori mining operations through the ages. Awareness of the historical value of the many mining relics and remains has made this site an attractive cultural and tourist attraction. A must-see. In Arditori, some 800 meters of galleries have been restored for public visiting, allowing the visitor to take an exciting journey back in time. The exploitation of this mine during the 19th and 20th centuries destroyed much of the Roman mine. But important remains of shafts, sloping ramps and numerous galleries of obvious Roman origin have survived. We are now in the Roman part of the Arditori mine. And in this area we can find a very characteristic element of some Roman mining techniques. These are the torrefaction domes. Here we can see the curious concave shape of one of them. With this technique, it was possible to advance in the successive fronts of tunneling. And here we have a good example, with the characteristic smooth walls and traces of charring. Torrefaction consisted of burning large quantities of wood next to the seams. The heat weakened and fractured the rock, making the hard work of breaking it easier. When this technique was used, the curious and characteristic concave dome-like shape remained. This is a prospecting gallery. The prospecting galleries were carved very steeply to try to locate the seams of ore. To overcome the slope, steps were carved at its base. Many prospecting galleries such as this one most probably did not achieve the expected results and the advance was abandoned. But many others like this one found very profitable scenes. 
Cuando esto ocurría, when this happened, work continued with the opening of a new gallery from the outside to enable convenient removal of material from the mine. Unlike the mining galleries, the galleries for access and transport of mined material were carefully finished with meticulously chiseled walls and the holes for the illuminating torches can be seen. And since the gallery was intended for people to have access, the floor was nicely leveled and smooth. We can also admire the drainage channel. We are descending into the deepest part of the Arditori mine that can be visited, about 15 meters below the main access gallery. At these depths, we are below the Oyadzun River, and the water seepage is heavy and continuous, in which case these galleries should be flooded. Finding them not to be flooded was quite a surprise for modern engineers, who sought an explanation for this mystery. They wanted to find out what strange phenomenon made the water disappear. And by following the water flow of the water, they found the answer here. A drainage gallery that the Romans designed and built to evacuate the water from here to a lower level in the river. Thanks to this, a large part of the mine with the richest part of the scene was not flooded and could be exploited. In the background, the noise reveals the strong river flow and pressure that the water reaches at the end of the gallery. For over 2,000 years and still today, this 425 meter long gallery continues to drain water and keep a large part of the mine free from flooding. For centuries, the locals considered the water that came out of it to be a strong natural source of underground water, without suspecting it to have been built by the Romans, nor its origin to be from the mine. As we have seen, thanks to the operation of the Roman drainage gallery, part of the Arditori mine is not flooded. And obviously, what is flooded is only that which is below the level of the drainage gallery. The modern exploitation of the Arditori mine progressed below this level, thanks to the fact that they had modern machines to pump and drain water. But what a surprise modern engineers got when they discovered that there was also evidence of Roman exploitation much lower, at at least 25 meters below. How did they do it? How could the Romans exploit this part of the mine if it was flooded? To answer this question, we will travel to the municipality of Minas de Rio Tinto, in the Spanish province of Huelva, in the southwest of the Iberian Peninsula. The municipality of Minas de Rio Tinto is located in a unique and imposing geological zone. 
its mineral wealth presents an array of colors, generating a magical landscape that could well pass as being from another planet. The municipality gets its name from the river that runs through it, the Tintor River known for the reddish tint of its waters. Its colouring has its origin in the minerals that are dissolved within it when crossing this unusual territory. This is the mining museum, one of the points to visit in the Rio Tinto mining park. In an absolutely essential visit, visitors can go through 5,000 years of history that the mining of this place has seen, from the Copper Age to the present day. In 1725, the modern exploitation of Rio Tinto began. In the 20th century, Rio Tinto had 16,000 workers and 149 locomotives that transported the materials to the nearby port of Huelva to be shipped to England. In June 1886, modern open-cast mining operations came across a mysterious and sophisticated buried wooden wheel. And it was not the only one. Several similar wheels were found in later years. In some cases, the reasons for the holes in the galleries in which they were buried could be figured out. In the Museum of Huelva, we can see one of these wheels. It is a specimen that has been preserved almost in its entirety. This wheel is made entirely of wood, with the exception of the axle, axis, which is made of bronze, has a diameter of 4 meters and 20 centimeters, and 50 radii. And it also has 25 buckets or drawers. The specialists were fascinated by the skill of its builders for the selection of the different types of wood, the skill in carving, and joining the pieces and the careful numbering used for their assembly. Carbon-14 dating places the origin of the Huelva Museum wheel to around the 1st century BC, confirming the fact of its Roman origin. Remains of more than 40 such wheels have been found in the Rio Tento area. Studies of these remains and the places in which they were found indicate that these wheels worked in pairs. Located at different levels and in a staggered manner. Everything suggests the conclusion that they were turned by hand and that their buckets drained the water from the numerous copper and silver mining operations that the Romans had in Rio Tinto. Studies have managed to accurately document some of the impressive lifting chains that were set up with these wheels. One of them raised water from a depth of over 81 meters to the surface using 22 floors each, with pairs of bucket wheels. Imagine the engineering work necessary to open the holes, assemble the wheels inside, and operate them by hand. Formidable and ingenious mechanical systems that undoubtedly must have been in constant operation to keep the mines from flooding. The chain pump and the bucket wheel were used very frequently in Roman mining. Chain wheel pumps have been found in large mines in the southern half of the Iberian Peninsula, as well as in Roman mines in Romania and Wales. And we know that the bucket wheels were not the only solution. 
In the silver mines in Santa Barbara in Posadas, Spanish province of Córdoba, a gallery 300 meters long and with a 30 degree slope was discovered. In a section equipped with a stepped battery of four Archimedean screws. In the Amelia Quarry in the Spanish province of Murcia and in the Sotiel mines in the Spanish province of Huelva, double piston pumps were found. Machines requiring very precise manufacture, usually made of cast bronze, whose carefully polished and adjusted pistons and cylinders propelled the water by means of the operation of a hand lever. And this is, without a doubt, the answer to the question of how the Romans could work the Arditori mine below the level of the drainage channel. Roman engineers had to design and build one or more drainage systems in order to be able to advance their efforts in places that would normally be flooded. As we have seen, the planning of underground mining complexes was a tremendously complex and difficult task for Roman engineers. But we still need to consider very important factors that we have not yet seen. To understand what we are saying, we will go to the municipality of Arboleas, about 100 kilometers from the Spanish city of Almería. Arboleas has about 6,000 inhabitants and is one of the few municipalities in the beautiful Almanzora Valley that manages to develop thanks to a successful strategy for the future. A fundamental part of this strategy is the economical promotion and awareness of these Roman mines. We are in Arboleas, which is opening the Roman mine of the Espejuelo to the public. Here we can see what attracted the Romans to this place. Selenite stone. The Romans highly valued these large gypsum crystals. They called them lapis specularis. They used them mainly as crystal windows. At this point, we can visualize the technique used to extract it by observing the original chisel marks that are still here. The miners cut down the rock around the crystals with precise strikes, increasing the number of these strikes at key locations. Once the crystal was exposed, it was hit from the side to dislodge it. Roman miners emptied these mines, leaving hardly any crystal. They only left what was no longer useful, because as you can see, behind it there is rock. We can see here, however, a large quantity of lapis specularis that was not extracted. Why? The answer to this question is the one that has mainly brought us here. The presence of this large piece of lapis specularis is due to a deliberate calculation and was left here for a very important reason. This piece supports the vault of the entire cave. Without it, much of the top would collapse. Not planning these aspects correctly could mean the death of the miners. The Hispanic mining deposits of Lapis Specularis were not only the best quality, but were also the most richly productive. To have an idea of the figures that were achieved, we will travel to the municipality of Osa de la Vega in the province of Cuenca, in the center of the Iberian Peninsula.
Lastly, here in the municipality of Osa de Vega, the so-called La Condenada mine has been opened to the public. La Mina de la Condenada is a perfectly calculated labyrinthine arrangement. Until the present time, three floors or levels of exploitation have been discovered, accessible to each other through intermediate shafts or flights of carved steps. There are also galleries and ramps that connect the different levels. The crystal extracted from the mines was cut with saws in specific and defined sizes to be industrially commercialized. Due to the nature of the crystal, which is formed in very thin layers, it could be easily exfoliated into separate sheets of different thicknesses by means of skillfully applied blows to the side. Researchers are still amazed. In these mines, the hardness of the embedded rocks that have to be broken and drilled is extreme. Today's specialist miners with modern tools take almost a month to advance little more than 10 meters. Modern diamond drills become literally scorched. And the scope and dimension of the mines exceeds what might be imagined, so far amounting to about 150 kilometers throughout the territory. How could Roman miners drill galleries and shafts with such hard rock with only iron tools. This is something really impressive. The figures that the Roman mining produced in this place were colossal. At the epicenter of these known 150 kilometers of mining operations, there was a city dedicated to the administration of all this commerce. Segobriga. The visit to Segobriga is a fascinating journey back in time. Its remains confirm its size and the importance of the Lapis Specularis trade in territory. We have only recently begun to study ancient mining, and what we have learned of Roman mining has left us as surprised as in awe. For the ingenuity for the technology deployed, for the efforts put into it, and for the scale of what was achieved. But even so, there is a Roman mining operation that surpasses everything we could imagine. We refer to the gold mines of Las Medulas in the Spanish province of León, in the north of the Iberian Peninsula. If we recall, in the Filiel mine, sediments rich in gold accumulated in a specific stretch of the Duerna River. Many gold recovery operations were undertaken with these accumulated heaps of sediment. Large deposits of gold-bearing materials that tend to be several meters high and several kilometers in length. Something similar happened in this place millions of years ago. A large river, perhaps several rivers, collected a great amount of gold-rich sediment here. But the geological conditions that occurred caused these sediments to build up in multiple layers reaching an enormous thickness and volume.
When the Romans arrived at this place, they were confronted with this view. Large mountains formed by huge amounts of gold-rich sediment. A place to get tons of this precious metal. But the challenge was daunting. Because how were they to demolish and dissolve entire mountains? Roman engineers rose to the challenge and conceived a plan so ingenious and ambitious that it bordered on the impossible, a colossal plan. The plan consisted of first deforesting the area and then disintegrating any mountain that contained gold, starting with the lowest in the valley, then moving towards the highest. In strategic places, an internal network of galleries was created by tunneling into the mountain. This network was carefully calculated in order to weaken it. While the network of galleries was being drilled, reservoirs were built to collect huge amounts of water at elevated locations. To fill them, powerful sources of water were located in rivers and streams that were at higher elevations. This required that water be captured many kilometers away. For this, several long-distance channels were designed and built. Once the network of galleries was completed, the reservoirs were successfully filled and emptied, thus releasing an enormous amount of water. The high speed flow gave the water great destructive energy, which ended up by causing massive erosion and pressure inside the mountain. Everything was perfectly arranged for the mountain to collapse. With the mountain literally disintegrated, it was possible to direct the gold-bearing sludge towards the washing channels, again using large quantities of water directed from the channels and from the reservoirs. Once the gold was extracted, waste accumulated in large areas occupying entire valleys, resulting in the creation of an artificial lake. The same technique would then be applied to the next sector of the gold field. And once the mountains of the same level were exhausted, they continued with the mountains of the next level above. The levels the water would have to reach became even higher, and to bring water to them, new sources were required, increasingly further away. Thus, the size of the network of channels grew progressively as the length of the channels increased. The exploitation of Las Medulas must have lasted more than a century and involved the efforts of thousands of men. Today we know that around 500 million cubic meters of material were removed. All this activity radically changed the landscape. Today, Las Medulas is a marvel named a World Heritage Site. a symbol of stubbornness and mankind's capacity for endeavor and sacrifice. The visit to the galleries and cavities that remain is overwhelming. But when the engineering work that was necessary is properly explained and the colossal efforts that were invested are understood, fascination and amazement turns to extreme admiration and we come to understand what we see. We have records of the tracks chosen for the water channels that were used. Thanks to those records, we know that some water sources were more than 140 kilometers away. We know that the incline of these channels remained constant 
and we know that the combined length of all the channels exceeded 650 kilometers. Las Medulas is considered to be the largest mining operation of antiquity, but east of Las Medulas there is a significant challenger. In the municipality of Villa Gaton, south of the town of Monte Alegre, researchers are excavating a spectacular Roman mining gallery 140 meters long, carefully constructed and finished. Studies indicate that this gallery belongs to a group of mining operations located in the Teleno mountain range. A gigantic mining complex planned as an entity that incorporated the Filiel mine. If confirmed, it could surpass that of Las Medulas in the processed material and in the gold obtained, once again exceeding everything conceivable and imaginable. We are at the end of this episode. In it, we have understood the importance that mining had to the commerce and prosperity of the Roman Empire. We have seen the colossal dimensions that many of its mining operations achieved, the immense efforts and the enormous amount of manpower that was invested in them. We have seen part of the processes that were necessary to crush, wash and extract the minerals. And the topographic and hydraulic engineering work used to plan the mining operations, to convey water to them and to drain it where it was not wanted.